Welcome to the Niche Pursuits Podcast. Today we're joined by Cyrus Shepard with Zippy.com. Cyrus has been in the SEO industry for a long, long time now. Uh, started at Moz.com, which is a very popular SEO website and uh, a software company. He was there for many, many years before branching out on his own. Um, Cyrus joins us today to talk about an internal link study that he published a little while ago. He studied over 1,800 different websites across 23 million URLs to gain insights on internal linking strategies. And so he joins us today to talk about the findings from this study. There's some really interesting findings. Now, sometimes when you get these studies, they have a lot of mixed data. They have a lot of inconclusive data. Cyrus has some really clear takeaways. He shares exactly the number of internal links you should be building to a page. He talks in depth about anchor text strategy for your internal linking, the keys to keep in mind. And I really go deep with him on all sorts of different internal linking topics, ranging from cannibalization, image internal linking, uh, exact match anchor text, uh, how important page sculpting is and if it's still a thing that matters these days, and on and on and on. Uh, right after we got done recording, Cyrus commented to me that that was the most in-depth he's ever gone on internal linking in a conversation before. So I say that means that you're in for a treat. Enjoy. Introducing nichesites.com. Are you looking to scale your niche site portfolio or build your first website? Look no further than nichesites.com. With a portfolio of successful websites and over 700 plus satisfied clients, the folks at nichesites.com have the skills and experience to help you succeed. From keyword research to link building, content writing to done for you websites, nichesites.com offers a full range of services to help your content site grow. As the saying goes, a trial is worth more than a thousand words, and they're offering a special trial just for new customers. You get 5,000 words of content completely free with your order of 10,000 plus traffic backlinks. Don't miss this opportunity. Head on over to nichesites.com slash trial and take advantage of this amazing trial offer. Again, it's niche sites, plural, nichesites.com slash trial. Go claim your free content today. Before we jump into the podcast, I wanted to let you know that today's episode is sponsored by Search Intelligence. Here's a short clip of Ferry from Search Intelligence showing you how their agency built digital PR links to a client's website. In this video, I will show you how we landed a placement on BBC and dozens of links in massive regional online publications such as Wares Online, Daily Post, and many more. This PR campaign was about the easiest place to pass your driving test for the first time in the UK. This is how we've done it. We simply went to DVLA website, found the latest car driving test data by test center and downloaded the data in a CSV format. Once we had the data, all we had to do is to look at the number of total tests per test center, then look at the number of first time passes to calculate the percentage of people who passed their test for the first time. Once we had the percentage numbers, we created a press release with our findings. Then we went to Rocks Hill and found journalists who talk about driving tests and also looked for journalists who write in regional publications in the UK. In total, we have found about 1,800 journalists and sent them our press release by email. Within less than a day, our story got picked up by BBC, Cornwall Live, Wells Online and dozens of other publications in the UK, providing our client a tsunami of backlinks perfectly relevant to the audience of the client who is a specialist in learner driver car insurance. I hope this video is helpful and it shows you how you can also build links with freely available data from official sources. If you want similar link building PR campaigns for your website, head to search-intelligence.co.uk and get in touch with them now. All right, welcome back to the Niche Pursuits podcast. My name is Jared Bauman. Today we're joined by Cyrus Shepard. Cyrus, welcome on board. Hey, Jared. Thanks for having me. Excited to be talking with you today. I am really excited to have you on board. I have been um, following along at, at zippy.com with a lot of your different... Uh, studies and deep dives into different parts of SEO over the years. Uh, I'm so glad to finally be able to connect with you. 
And uh, today we're going to kind of zero in on one specific topic. Before we do, though, maybe give us some backstory on who you are and how you got involved in this industry and, you know, kind of catch the readers up and the listeners up to who you are. Yeah, sure. Uh, I'm Cyrus. I studied uh, film in college, which is a perfect segue to marketing because I failed as a Hollywood screenwriter. Uh, but I got my start in SEO the way a lot of people did. I had I had websites. I was trying to market them. I uh, didn't want to spend a lot of money on AdWords at the time. And uh, I ended up joining this company called SEO Moz in 2011. It's known as Moz today. Uh, and back then, you know, it was it was like the biggest SEO company on the planet, and we just had a lot of fun. It felt like every day going into work, we were inventing the internet. Um, and at Moz, I did a lot of uh, large scale experiments, or I ran a lot of large scale experiments. Which, you know, back in the day, we tested Google's algorithm. I think a lot more than we do today. Maybe because mm-hmm. it was simpler back then, or Google uh, just that people were just trying to figure things out. And I, I really miss that. So today in my career. Uh, I try to run experiments whenever I can, publish them whenever I can, and I think it I think it's the most fun thing that I do. First fun fact, I didn't know it was originally called SEO Moz. I always knew it just as Moz. Yeah, so yeah, Moz founded in two thousand four by Rand Fishkin and his his mother. Uh yeah, it was it was the idea was Moz was sort of uh Mozilla. It was kind of the open movement, the open internet movement, and they were, you know, trying to be a part of that. So, yeah, yeah, I always say SEO companies are terrible at choosing names. (laughs) Yeah, well, we're not too creative, are we? (laughs) Speaking of which, I actually have a photography background, so that's really interesting. I don't meet many people from the creative space that end up in SEO. It's kind of a right brain, left brain thing. But um, what was um, so what was your role at Moz and what did you end up doing at Moz for the time you were there? Uh, so I started off in customer service, customer support. I also unloaded the dishwasher every morning at 6 a.m. Uh, I was the only one in the office answering phone calls. Hello, hello. Uh, you know, helping people with their, their porn sites, whatever whatever it was that uh, they had signed up to SEO Moz. Uh, then I transitioned over to the marketing and doing actual SEO. Uh, and I led SEO and content uh, for several years. I I had three, actually three different stints at Moz. I always came back to the job. It's the job I could never quit. Uh, left for the final time when they were acquired by Eye Contact Marketing Group uh, a year or two back. And uh, but still, lots of love for the old company. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, you, you you're now at Zippy, which is uh, your own company. It's an SEO consulting company. You guys also make software. Um, you, you mentioned you transitioned over the course of the last. Good many years, I guess. You said you had many exits mm. from Moz. <laughs> but, um, you know, um, I guess to set the stage for today, the the study that you did in particular that caught my eye and I think is going to be a perfect um, uh, almost like case study for us to talk through today is your study on internal links. And um, yeah. it, it, I would say it's probably not a very – popularized study subject, right? Like we get a lot of studies on backlinks. We get a lot of studies on intricacies with backlinks and keywords and rankings and on page stuff. Obviously internal linking could be considered linking, could be considered on page, but it's not studied that much. What gave you the impetus to study internal links and, um, and, and produce this study? Yeah, great question. So whenever I talk to agency owners um, and we've, we've sort of chatted about this before a little bit, but whenever, agencies need to move the needle quickly for clients uh, because clients don't want to wait six months to see results. They need to move the levers that they can control very quickly. And and generally those are, uh, you know, metadata, title tags, meta descriptions, things that show up in SERPs pretty quickly. Uh, The other lever that they can pull really quickly is internal links uh, because you can link to yourself much quicker than you can asking someone else for a link. And you should still do those things, but improving your internal linking uh, is one of the fastest, most effective ways you can do uh, for a quick win. So that's, those are the first two studies that we ran were title tags and internal linking. Ah, I saw the title tag one. I was going to, if we had time, I, I have that down. But but today we're talking internal links. I mean, we do talk yep. internal links a decent amount around here. Obviously, Spencer, the the founder, uh, owns Link Whisper, which is an internal linking plugin, and um, I helped uh, test that when it was first started. And it's such a internal linking can be so frustrating, especially like you said for agencies or for people who are trying to uh, you know build links internally at scale. So, um, anyways. Before I bury the lead, like let's dive into it. Um, let's talk about this. You analyzed, I think you said somewhere near 2,000 websites. 
uh, 23 million internal links. Like, why don't you set the stage for the, for the, for the yeah. study, and we'll get into some of the findings. Yeah, and I want to circle back to Link Whisper and other tools, which I recommend all the time, and why I think we should use them. But first, let's set the stage. Uh, so, yeah, so you often see studies on linking, external linking, uh, and I think one of the reasons is those studies are – much easier to run mm. uh having having sort of run a few myself you, you you can get some you know data from arefs or SEMrush and you know compare it against rankings things like that but we wanted to dive a little bit deeper so we had 1800 websites uh, 23 million uh internal links and we had access to google search console which these folks had opted into so we oh. could look at anonymized uh google search console data so we could actually correlate internal link our internal link metrics with actual google traffic and we could see what's working and what's not working and, and that surprisingly we found some positive relationships between internal links and and google traffic that's that's the very first thing we found so more internal links more traffic i i suppose that's obvious is there, are there any yeah. breakpoints <laughs> thresholds or yeah. anything beyond just more is better yeah well, first of all, we're just happy to see the positive correlation that, yes, more internal links actually works. It actually increases traffic. If you have a page with no internal links, it's 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 usually not going to get a lot of traffic. Uh, but it was if you, didn't, uh, if you didn't say that. Yeah. So it, but the funny thing we found was the relationship only worked to a point. Uh, we saw this this graph that went up and to the right. And then after about, you know, 20, 30 links, it, it just sort of like zigzagging up and down and there we discovered the reason for that uh and it had more to do with the type of internal link uh that was that people were using so that that was interesting let me ask you this question it and if this is going too deep too fast tell me if we're going to get into it a little bit later but yeah um it makes perfect good perfectly good sense that if a page has zero internal links pointing to it Obviously, that's bad. It makes it highly uncrawlable for Google, especially as it ages. It gets buried in your site's architecture. However, why is, um, I, in theory, more is always better, but why, why is more better? And is there a certain limit? You talked about how at some point there's diminishing returns. Like, is there a certain limit to the number that are positively effective for the, for the page? Yeah, so I'm going to get right into it here. Uh, but first, I want to preface this. What we learn about links is a little bit misguided, I think, uh, in the SEO industry, because we're always talking about page rank or uh, link juice, blah, 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 whatever term you want to use. Every every tool has its own metrics, domain authority. Uh, the problem is, the problem, and this is based on Google's, you know, original page rank paper from many, many years ago. But the problem is links actually pass two, two major classes of signals. One is popularity, which is page rank or whatever we think of as, you know, link juice, link power. But the other is relevance, yep. which is mostly derived from anchor text. Yep. Uh, and SEO tools, you know, Moz is certainly guilty of this, ARES, all, all the major tool providers are guilty of using the popularity metric and pushing that in their interfaces, uh, making it what people use. But we don't look at the relevancy part, and that's like 50% of the link. Uh, so when you have internal links, uh, you can control that relevancy to a certain extent. Now, there's indication that Google doesn't count internal links as much as external links, but you're relying, if you're not internally linking, you're relying on other people for that for that both the popularity and the relevance. And it's really hard to control the anchor text that other people are, are linking to you with. So we looked at both uh, popularity and relevance. And when we started looking at anchor text, that's when the real interesting relationships started popping out. I'm, I'm, I'm talking too much. I'll, I'll let you pop in with a question if you want. No, you're the, you're the, you're the value here, trust me. The, All right. the less I talk, the better. <laughs> All right, so I talked about how we saw this. We had this graph that went up and to the right, yep. and then after a certain point, it, it petered out. What we found was those petered out links were navigation links. When when a site links uh, in the navigation, you know, in the top navigation, you if you have a thousand page site, you have a thousand internal links all with the same anchor text, uh, and we saw a diminishing returns on those types of links. But when we looked, then we looked at something different. How many different types? of anchor text uh, was being used. So different that means different phrases. So click here, uh, best camera, um, Nikon 378. We looked at how many different types of anchor text each link had. When we charted that, the chart went up and to the right, 
and it never came down. Uh, we ran the data three different times to, to all the way to the right, and the, the relationship kept going up and up and up. So to summarize this, to t try to distill it down, it's not the number, sheer number of links in our data that we found had a positive relation. It was the number of different types of links and the variety of anchor text uh, that made the most significant difference if a page ranked higher or not. Uh, hopefully, hopefully that's easy to understand. I, the problem is I have about 20 questions already. <laughs> <laughs> but this is sure. great. So number one, more in general, more uh, more internal links led to higher traffic. Yep. Number two, varied anchor text led to higher traffic. Yes, more importantly than just the number of links. Just important. So, oh, more importantly, okay. So having a good number of internal links with varied anchor text is the proverbial holy grail of internal linking. Yeah, and you think of it like this. Uh, let's go back to that, you know, that navigation text again. If I you, if I link to a page in my navigation, I get the same anchor text. I get a, I might have I might have a thousand links on my site going to that page because it's in the navigation, but the anchor text is the same yep. every single time. Yep. So I get that I get that popularity, but I only get you know one chance at a at a relevant signal, and. You know, there's different ways of thinking about this. Uh, you could think, wow, I have a thousand links pointing to that page uh, in my navigation. I have a thousand anchor texts that say best cameras. Uh, Google must really like those thousand anchor texts. If I was Google, I would just count that as one anchor text. I would, you know, consolidate that and uh, canonicalize that into, you know, one signal. So, yeah, I have a thousand links, but I really only have one anchor text. Yep. So I, I might want to vary that up to give Google more information. And we find when people do that, it, it tends to have really positive results. You mentioned navigational. Are there any other types of internal links that probably aren't weighed as heavily? I'm thinking footer. I'm thinking related yeah. posts. I'm thinking sidebar. Yep. Uh, I, I don't know, more maybe. Yeah, so I always tell people, uh, years ago, years ago, I was listening to Matt Cutts, uh, who was the former head of spam at Google, and he said something, and I can't find a reference to it anywhere on the internet. I swear it happened, but he was like, <laughs> pay attention to that first link on your page. And then he stopped, and he said, pay very close attention to that first link on the page. Uh, and that's the idea of Reasonable Surfer, that Google, Google Pat can pass more weight through links that people actually click uh, or are likely to click. And I was just reading that patent the other day. And, you know, they can me Google can measure the links that people click through Chrome, the, the most widely adopted browser in the world. They can see what people are clicking on. They don't need to measure every click. They can just start, they can just record enough that they have a machine learning model. And so when they see a new page, they can apply their link weighting algorithms and understand that people are going to click links that are high up on the page, uh, prominently displayed, as opposed to, you know, links in the footer, links in the sidebar, links in, you know, top articles. Uh, so when I'm internally linking and I have something important, I put it in the first couple of paragraphs of my main body text. Uh, if And, you know, links to competitors, I'll put, I'll put down below. But I, I try to keep them high and tight, uh, kind of a military term, high and tight, prominent, that make, make sure people are clicking on those links. And you can look in the, your analytics to see how many pages uh, per visit people are uh, visiting um, on your site. And if you have those great internal links, you know, you can see those metrics start to go up sometimes because you know people are actually clicking on them. In terms of, and you touched on it already, in terms of having your example where you have the same anchor text in the navigational menu a thousand times, right? So yep. you have that nice drop down menu and it links to a a page on your site and because that loads on every page of your site because it's the menu it's going to send a link from every page it's the same it's duplicate anchor text you yeah. talked about how that doesn't probably have much weight to benefit you does duplicate anchor text at any point even outside of nav navigational linking have a um can it actually hurt you yeah, uh, yeah. There is definitely the idea of over optimization, especially for smaller sites that don't have a a diverse link profile. Now, I'm going to take a sidetrack here for a second. Uh, large sites, large uh, retailers, things like that, they can get away quite easily with a large navigation. Uh, 
mega mega menu things like that and and part of the reason i believe I, I i can't confirm it they already have a diverse and broad anchor text uh profile if you look at sites like you know walmart look at any page on walmart or amazon mm-hmm. or any any major e uh e-tailer uh and look at their backlink profile every page has way way uh, high diversity of anchor text. You, as a small site, and me, as a small site, we don't necessarily have that. So we might want to pare down our navigation and do more in-body linking, as opposed to relying on that on that top-level navigation. That, and that gives us greater greater control. I lost the thread. I forget what the question was. No, you're on you're on the right you're on the right track. I'm just trying to zero in on this idea of having a lot of oh. the same anchor text. Yes, we talked about how it has low value. Yep. But yeah. does it have Nate? Could it hurt you? I guess. Yeah, and again, if you're okay, exactly. I, I know where I was going now. <laughs> and so again, if you're a smaller site and you don't have this huge uh, backlink profile of external sites, uh, and you start linking to yourself with optimized anchor text uh, that's you know the same on you know uh, best Nikon camera 2023, and it's it's a money money term, and you do that on every page. Yes, that can hurt you. It looks over optimized to Google. Uh, we don't we don't know exactly how google does this and we don't have a lot of um validated proof but we we do understand google can penalize sites for being over optimized and that's that's one of the key ways you can shoot yourself in the foot is using over over optimized anchor text every single time yeah you're right and we hear about it more on the external backlink side you know anchor yep. text from an outbound or sorry anchor text from other domains to our website is much further scrutinized than our mm-hmm. internal linking anchor text but it still has an effect is what you're saying yeah, a- absolutely. So uh, the way I like to do it uh, internally linking um, is I, I don't think there's anything such as a bad link, but I like I, I personally under optimized every internal link that I can. Uh, I make sure there's some keywords in there, uh, but I tend to go, uh, you know, the ideal internal link is like three or four words long, usually, you know, something clickable. I like to go make sure I have add an extra word or make sure it's a phrase that uh, Google hasn't seen before in my backlink profile. So, you know, uh, if, if the keyword was best Nikon camera 2023, I certainly wouldn't link to it with those keywords. I'd be like, you know, check out these uh, cameras that we think are the best of Nikon. I know I'm giving a terrible example. Okay. Here. You need a little more creativity than that, but I would make sure it's varied every time and not perfectly optimized. Good. So that's my next question is walk us through what it looks like to do anchor text properly and maybe tackle it from this standpoint. Is it more important in concept that I think of my anchor text as a way to pass relevance or as a way to help me rank for certain keywords? Oh, uh, that's, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, you, I don't. I think you can do both. The way the way I I like to do it is I will look in Google Search Console and I'll navigate to the specific page, assuming it's an existing page. Uh, if it's a brand new page, you there's other ways you can do it. And I'll look at all the different keyword variations right. uh, that the page ranks for, and I'll take those and I will work those. I'll add an extra word or two to each of those phrases, and I'll work them into my anchor text. If it's a brand new page, I will look for pages that are already ranking in AREFs or SEMrush, and I'll see the I'll see the keyword phrases that that page is ranking for, and I'll use variations of those keyword phrases to work into my anchor text, making sure I change them every time and they're not overly optimized. I I'm not a huge fan of links, you know, some people vary their anchor text by completely under optimizing them and saying, click here, um, or use naked URLs. And naked URLs is when I just link to the URLs in our, in our, we actually looked at this in our study and we found that people who use naked URLs, uh, actually, uh, pages that had naked URLs as anchors actually ranked higher than pages that didn't have any naked URLs, which is interesting. Wow. It goes to my point that I don't think there are any bad, uh, bad anchor text that you could use. I don't like using click here or generic anchor text. I think Google has ways of devaluate, devaluing links that, you know, don't get clicked or don't have relevant information. Uh, but so I like to, I like to have every, every anchor text contain at least one keyword. You don't have to overdo it, but that's how I do it. I'm, I'm rambling again. Sorry. I'm an excellent podcast guest. You are. Yeah, we're going to put time <laughs> perfectly well. The problem is, is that I'm holding up for the Google on YouTube. I've already written a whole page's worth of questions. So uh, uh, we got lots to get through, but that's okay. We, we, we have all day, as they say. 
Before we jump into the podcast, I wanted to let you know that today's episode is sponsored by Search Intelligence. Here's a short clip of Ferry from Search Intelligence showing you how their agency built digital PR links to a client's website. This is how we landed massive links for our client in The Sun, a DR90 website, and many other UK news websites. We have used freely available data from YouGov to simply find out what the nation's favorite car brand is and which brands people love the most. Of course, Rolls-Royce came out on top, Aston Martin second, and Jaguar third. We put these insights in a short email and sent it to journalists that write about cars and to national news desks on behalf of our client. Within a few days, our client got featured in all the suns, as well as many regional newspaper sites in the UK, gaining DR90 links to their leasing comparison website. Yugo website is full of unlimited PR stories with data already available for free. All you have to do is to start researching their data and start asking the data questions. You will be surprised of the unlimited PR campaigns that you will find there that can help you build massive exposure and links to your or your client's websites. I hope this video is helpful and inspirational. If you want similar link building PR campaigns for your website, head to search-intelligence.co.uk and get in touch with them now. So let me ask you, continuing down the anchor text theme, because I, I love it. I, I think, again, we don't talk about internal linking enough. We talk about backlinks more. When we talk about internal linking, we tend to talk more about how many you're sending. We'll come back to that, but I love that we're on this anchor text focus. And you talked about how important it is for passing relevance. So when I look at sending an internal link from one page to another, how mm. important is it that the page sending the internal link ranks? And how important is it that that page ranks for certain keywords? And does that play a part in what relevance it sends to the anchor text, uh, sorry, to the internal link? Yeah. Uh, hugely important if you can do it, but it's not, it's not a deal breaker. Uh, yes, you want to get links from pages that rank, uh, that would be ideal, but as long as they are in the same thematic ballpark, I think it's okay. Um, if you have, if you have a paragraph of text, that's not exactly what the page is about, but it's, you know, it's really, really close. Um, it's, I, I think, I think that's good enough. 99% of the time. Uh, even I, I'll even take a link from a totally irrelevant page, but I, I think that starts to look a little spammy, and I think Google can sort of sense that out. Uh, but yeah, as long as they're in the same thematic ballpark, I, I think you're okay. And a lot of people worry about uh, cannibalization. Like, okay, here here's my... Here's my page about cameras. Well, I don't want to link to this other page about cameras because uh, I don't want to. I don't want to pass my relevancy uh, signals to that other page. I I think in practice uh, that's fine. It's fine to do that. The only time you, you're going to get in trouble is if the wrong page starts ranking and maybe you have to rearrange some of those signals. But I would I would to totally link to other pages with rich anchor text just don't use the exact phrase that you're trying to get that first page to rank for so if if you have the, you have best nikon cameras 2023 and you want that page to rank for that keyword don't rank out to another page that says best nikon cameras 2023 change it up be more specific about what it's about because hopefully it has a slightly different intent and google can rank both those pages for very similar terms how does your study i'm going to throw a concept at you that i hear a lot um uh and how does your study have any insights into it the idea of uh link sculpting or page sculpting right and i'll kind of set mm -hmm. the stage i hope i don't butcher it correct me yep. if i'm wrong any of it but this idea that you um basically control every link on a certain page you control the anchor text and you control where you send the internal link because page rank in its concept and the link juice you get to that page is kind of divided by the number of outbound or inbound links you have, right? And so yeah. you want to be very careful about a page, especially a page that has a lot of backlinks. You want to kind of sculpt where it sends that link juice to and the anchor text. And, um, you know, I'm just curious how important that is nowadays, if that's important at all, yeah. how much internal linking comes to play, because that's a, that's a, that's a strategy a lot of people use, right? Yeah. yeah uh, this is a great question and thank you for asking it. I, Page rank sculpting is an old SEO idea that really reached its heyday around 2010, 2011. Uh, most people don't even remember you it anymore. You didn't have to date the, like that, Cyrus. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, 
and back in the day, if you no followed a link, uh, you could easily uh, sculpt PageRank. If you no followed one link, more juice passed through the other links. So people were no following their unimportant links, so more juice would pass through their followed links. And then uh, uh, Google came out and they they killed that practice. Uh, no following links did not give you more juice through your through your other links, and as a result, Google started saying things like page rank sculpting doesn't work, and people were like, oh, page rank sculpting is dead. No, page rank sculpting skill works even today, 2023. It's just you can't do it through the use of no follow. You can still control how page rank and other signals pass through your pages, just can't do it with no follow anymore. So one way that you can control it, uh, as we talked about, uh, is the position of the link on the page. Uh, pa links in better positions are going to pass more signals. Uh, so your footer links, probably not going to pass a lot. But the link high and tight in the first couple of paragraphs, yes, it's going to pass more. Uh, the other way to control it is the number of links on the page. So if you have a 1,000 links on your page, each one's only going to pass a tiny bit. But if you can pare it down to 10 links, you're going to get better signals through those. Uh, so there, are, I'm a huge fan today of page rank sculpting, uh, and I think uh, a lot of I, I, it's a shame that Google kind of won that narrative uh, with the SEO world and stopped people from doing it um, back before back before they had this machine of the. Uh, Google Search Console team, the webmasters, and everything like that. Uh, listen to old school SEOs uh, first. A lot oh, yeah. of page rank sculpting. A lot of content I love it. Still remain right. Yeah. Can, now, can I get into the weeds about page rank sculpting for a second? I'd love it. Yeah. Okay. I, I All right. Have more questions on it, so you'll probably just you'll probably answer them. I think it's good. All right. Let's so on this a little bit. So here's a here's a post we're going to publish here in a couple of weeks. You get a you get a preview. We talked about those those navigation links, right? You link in the navigation. Well, Google has this thing called first link priority, which I, it's another thing we don't talk about very much. And that is when Google sees more than one. And, okay, let's let's set, let's set the stage. You have a link in your navigation goes to your money page. You have a link in your post beneath that link that also goes to your mm. money page. Does Google count those two links equally? Mm. So first link priority, which is another concept, uh, says no. Google gives priority to the first link, meaning they'll pass page rank through both those things, but you only get anchor text from the first one. Uh, so uh, we set out to test this recently, and what we found is that, yes, first link priority is still a thing with Google. Uh, when we have more than one link on the page going to another page, Google counts the first anchor text, they will not count the second anchor text unless it's an image. Uh, the image exception rule uh, comes into play here. So that if you have a product, product image, product description, they both link, both those anchor texts will count. But you have to be careful when you link over and over again to the same page because Google is probably only counting that first anchor text. And that's something that, uh, that's another way that you can page rank sculpt or pare things down, but it, it's important to remember that that concept. We're going to be publishing uh, a post on that pretty soon. We'll get that in the show notes. Who knows? <laughs> it might be time to come out right when this interview comes out, so it could be perfect. Yeah, all right. Um, going back to that concept of page sculpting and, and kind of diving even further, you, you talked about how if you have a thousand links on one page, it's mm -hmm. passing very little uh, link juice per se. But does the um, relevancy get diluted? Because we've been talking a lot about anchor text and relevancy. Does that relevancy still pass through just as much with a lot of links on a page? Or does that matter at all? That, that's a great question. I don't know the exact answer, but I would suspect uh, less. There's this concept of uh, topic-weighted page rank, uh, which is just the same way that Signals pass, page rank passes through links, topicality passes through links. And it works the same way as page rank, the way they calculate it. So if you have a page and it's about cameras and you have a thousand links, each one, that topic weighted page rank is going to get diluted if, you know, with every additional link that you add. So yeah, uh, relevance is most likely, I, I, I can't say definitive, yeah. definitively because I don't have insight into Google's algorithm. But yeah, I would imagine that topicality and relevancy does diminish the more links you add per page. So we've been circling about the importance of both the number of internal links you have and the anchor text you choose to use. Again, the number of internal links is directly correlated to the traffic on the page, more the better. 
and the very the variedness of your anchor text is directly correlated to better traffic. Is there? A, we've also established though that too many anchor texts on one page, uh, sorry, too many internal links on one page starts to dilute things. So, is there a certain number of internal links in your study that is maybe a sweet spot where we're maximizing the number that goes to the benefit versus the dilution that comes as a result of it? Yeah, I, I, I like to say that there's no set number. It's ten. <laughs> uh, it's ten. So <laughs> in our data, people will say, "How many internal links do I have?" In our data, uh, we found. The, the the graphs rose pretty steeply up until about 10. After that, it, it, it sort of died down a little bit. But uh, we strive to get, for every page that's important that we want to rank, we strive for an average of 10 varied internal links from different pages on our site. And 10's a lot. I mean, if you're like me, you, you know when you write a page, if it's a new page or an existing page, if you're really doing your job, you might go find three or four relevant pages yeah. and add some links and you're like, oh, God, I'm, I'm done. I'm going to go have a coffee. Uh, ten links? Ten links is a lot. Uh, and, especially, and it's especially hard to do when you're linking to brand new content to go back and add those links. And there's a, there, I, have, I have a way to do that that I should talk about. But, yeah, ten links is a lot, but it's, it's definitely something you should do. Uh, don't let me die. If there's okay. a way to do, dive in, please. All right. So adding so there let's talk about the concept of adding links to existing content. Yep. When you're when you're writing a new post, you're writing new new paragraphs, you're writing new links, it's all it's all fresh content. So a lot, there's a lot of debate around this and uh a lot of nuance, but one popular way of adding links to existing content is uh, you, you run a search for the exact phrase that you want. You find it in your existing content, uh, best camera, and you, you just go back and you don't change anything about the post. You just highlight that link and you link it. Yep. Uh, I, I, there's evidence that that is effective, uh, but it's not the way I prefer to do it. Okay. Um, because Google can see that you just added a link. You didn't change anything about the content. I like to rewrite or add a sentence or two of text to wherever that paragraph is and update the old content a little bit with the new link. Uh, I found over the years that that is more effective than simply highlighting something and adding a link to existing text uh, because you get some fresh, fresh signals there. You get, you get a tiny bit of new content. Uh, it doesn't look like you just did an automated linking, but that's how I like to do it. I, I don't like to just highlight exact match uh, anchors, Take the, take the effort and update the sentence. Make it look like a human was in there and actually cared. And I think you'll do a better job. And that probably would also allow you to get more internal links to hit that yeah. 10 number because yeah. chances are you maybe didn't have that exact phrase and you yeah. wanted to find a, a way to work it in. Yeah. And the other, and here here is a plug for Link Whisper. Uh, a lot of people, I, I a lot of people don't make, take advantage of automated internal linking tools, uh, Link Whisper being one of them. We had one at Zippy for a while as part of our software suite that we, we sold off. Uh, internal linking, it's hard, especially if you're scaling it out and you're working with writers that uh, aren't as familiar with your content. I think using automation and using tools to find opportunities, and I won't mention you know many of your competitors, but there, there, there's a few of them out there. I think using automation in internal link building is is necessary because finding those 10 links or more for every page uh especially if you're doing it at scale it's it's difficult uh it's you may think you know what your most relevant pages are uh but having machines do this that can process and understand very quickly where your opportunities are uh, i think it's a no-brainer especially for agencies and folks working with larger sites so i'm a huge fan of using tools and automation in internal linking to help you find those opportunities well, glad to hear the internal link expert is a fan of uh, Link Whisper. Uh, <laughs> let me ask you about that, because you, you kind of touched on these threads here, and I want to outline maybe a typical scenario for a website builder, and I want to get your take on the best approach to a internal linking strategy. Um, let's say that I'm uh, building out a topical hub, right? Mm -hmm. And so I'm, well, let's go down the camera theme, and let's say that I'm going to write about um, wildlife cameras. And I'm thinking that's a little different than the brand. We'll talk about wildlife. Mm -hmm. uh, Ex-photographer here, so you actually picked a topic I could talk quite a bit about. Um, we're going to go down the, down the road of wildlife cameras. So we're going to build out this topical hub all around cameras and wildlife. We're going to probably talk about cameras and lenses and lighting and all these different things. Mm -hmm. So as I start writing this content, I start releasing an article one by one. I write the first article. 
top 10 considerations for wildlife photography. I got nothing to internally link to because it's the first mm -hmm. article that's just come out in this topical silo, right? As I get to article number 10, I now have nine other internal links I could place, theoretically, yep. probably not all are relevant. By the time I get to article 50, I'm probably able to get 10 internal links in, right? But what about yeah. that article that I published the first one out of the gate? And so there's this problem that exists for people like, how do you manage internal links as you're building out, say, a topical hub or a website? When is the right time to go back and add them back in? It, does it need to be part of a larger up, uh, article update process? Like, talk to people for how they yeah. make internal linking a part of their overall strategy and their workflow. Yeah, that's that's a great question, and I, I'm not sure there's one answer for all of it. When I do uh, content planning and writing content briefs for clients, we usually include that as part of the process, as part of the mapping, showing how the articles will link together, ideally, uh, and we're pretty we're pretty generous with those links. Uh, it's still kind of hard to add when you haven't added the content yet, right. and you have to go back and you have to add that. So my my advice is to add those. Start with a plan. Uh, if you sometimes you d you don't plan 50 articles in advance, uh, but if you can start with a plan, do that. Put those links in as soon as possible. Or sometimes, I mean, it's not ideal, but sometimes you know you should be probably updating your content every couple years at most. You can make that part of that process. If not, uh, I'm I'm not I I'm a link evangelist. And I don't want to say that you should drop everything else, every other part of your SEO process to update links, and it's the number one priority. Uh, sometimes life and you know other business uh, decisions intervene, but make it part of your cycle. Uh, and I just, you know, I I manage content teams, uh, and I work I've worked with a lot of content teams, and I know it's just never a priority unless they make it a priority. Uh, and usually it's. Usually it's the internal linking sprint uh, where we have to go through and do this and identify the pages. Uh, but if you can make it part of your process, yeah. uh, you know, every time um, you write a content brief or you plan content, where are those 10 links coming from? It makes it easier down the, the road instead of doing that, that big sprint that everybody has to be involved in. Yeah, no, I think it makes a lot of sense. I mean, updating old content is something that most SEOs agree you should do. Right. Like there's more studies that support it really helping your website than not. And yet it's another one of those things that it's always like, for some reason, we always just want to go publish new content. Right. Um, and so if you can make article updating and internal linking a part of a continuous process, that's that's good advice. Yeah. You know, one thing I the total side bomb hint here. Uh, one thing I hate is uh, people have related links on their site, right? Uh, related link widgets you might also like. Um, and I get why they, and they, they put those in like, hey, I have internal links. Problem is, no one gets to the bottom of the article and clicks those links. You probably have like a less than a 1% uh, click through rate on those. Um, very few people clicking. And, and if few people are clicking, that's a proxy for how much value Google is putting on those links as well. Uh, you, you haven't done your job of internal linking if you just stuck a widget at the bottom of your page. But one thing uh, we experimented with at Moz quite a bit is if those links are actually valuable, put them at the top of the page. Uh, if, if, we, if, you're, if people are searching for information on canonical tags and you have your, this article on canon, canonical tags, don't wait till the bottom of the page to show other articles on canonical tags. Put those high and tight near the top because they're high intent pages that people are actually probably interested in clicking in. So if you have a, a, a related links widget or something like that, I say put it near the top, make it make them relevant to, to where people are going to click and look at, serve the user. And you can see in your analytics, again, if people are visiting more pages per visit, that's how you know you're doing your job because you're giving people to, things to click on. I know people who advocate against a related post or related link, uh, plug-in widget thing, you know, mm -hmm. section um, for various reasons. Do you think site owners should keep them on their website, even if they keep them at the bottom? Do you think they're damaging, or do you think that they probably add minimal value? Uh, I don't think they're damaging. I think they add very minimal value. Um, you, you can't, and especially, especially if you're you're relying them as your primary source of internal linking. Uh, you're getting the same anchor text every time. Uh, it's it's just not doing much for you. So I'm not opposed to them, but I, I don't think people are getting much out of them. Yeah, they are out there. Um, let's see. I have three topics I want to ask you about. I'm trying to figure out which one first. Let's talk about 
that naked URL topic you brought up. Yeah. I'm um, very surprised to hear you say that the data correlated that there was actually a little bit of an uptick by using naked URLs. I'm trying to even think how I would work that in to my yes. article and stuff. Like, why, why does that matter? And I know that naked URLs help to kind of even out your backlink profile, but why is it a big deal when it comes to internal linking? Yeah. Uh, so, and to be clear, Google Google's official advice is not use naked URLs, uh, use descriptive anchor text. But the reality is sometimes, especially, you know, large organizations or whatever your CMS spits something out, you get something that's just a URL. And I think the only reason works why we see good traffic with folks using naked urls is an accident it it balances out over optimized anchor text it adds some variety um and it's at the end of the day it's still a link uh it's a different type of link so i i don't think the evidence supports that google ignores naked urls uh but it seems like it i think it speaks to the idea that you should have variety in your anchor text and not that you should be using naked urls so there, there's some we don't yeah. need everyone listening to this podcast to go out and now start including naked url uh internal links <laughs> yeah it just we, supports variation as the key yeah although there there is some evidence not strong evidence but based on google statements and some things we see there are you can have such bad anchor text that google ignores your link uh it may not pass any signals whatsoever if you're if you're just saying click here or empty anchor text, uh, you know, which happens a lot, especially in images. Remember in images, you get the extra anchor text. Even if you link to it any anywhere else on your page, it gives you another opportunity to add anchor text to that image under the alt tag. Uh, so one mistake people make is always using the same anchor text with the image as they do with their other links. Always vary that anchor text because it's another sh shot at uh, Getting, getting a small relevancy signal pointed at that page. That was one of my three remaining questions. Ah. Images. So yeah. you're, um, let's, let's kind of unpack that a little bit so everyone understands clearly. When I put an image on a page, why is that an internal link and how do I use that to my advantage? Yeah. So uh, image on a page, you can link to it. The Instead of alt text, it's the... Um, Instead of a link, it's the alt text, which counts as the anchor text. In our data, so our, over our, our 23 million links, we found 5%. 5% of all internal links had empty anchor text, meaning they had no anchor or no image alt. 95% of the empty anchor text were images. Uh, so there is a huge number of people in our data set that just left their image links blank. Uh, and that gives Google nothing to work with. So you want to make sure that you're filling in those alt, alt attributes every single time with varied anchor text. It's not a huge signal. Uh, it's, pr it's probably likely that Google weighs image links slightly less than regular links. Um, we can't confirm that, but that there's some indication that that's true. Uh, but yeah, don't don't sleep on it. You're you're just leaving anchor text on the table when you leave those images blank. So fill out anchor text, that's important. Yeah. How does, I'm still wondering, I still wanna really unpack the idea that internal linking comes as a result of images because um, how does the image relate to a link? I know that the image has a URL itself. When you click on the yeah. image, unless it's yeah. out the light box, it's gonna be popping out with a new URL. But yeah. uh, where does that play into internal linking? Well, if you if you so if you go in and manually add a link to that image, uh, wrap it in an A tag pointing to another page. Yes. So it's not so much it's not so much the URL of that the image, uh, which can cause some own, its own problems in and of itself. But when you wrap the, when you wrap the image uh, in an A tag and link it to another page, okay. make the link make the image clickable. Yeah, that's what I wanted to hear. Okay, cool. Okay, that's good. And then. When you do that, the alt text you're using for that image is basically the anchor text. Yes, exactly. Got it. So, uh, you, and you can you can crawl any large e-commerce site or any site, uh, really, and you will very quickly find images without linked images without their alt tags uh, included, and that's just that's just missed opportunities. Ah! We see it all the time when we do an Ahrefs uh, Ahrefs site audit. It's like missing alt text, and yeah. uh, that's where you see it, right? Yeah. Um, you see a lot of it. Okay, so question three of three on my long list here. Um, don't worry, we can go further, but these are the three important ones I had to get to. You, you mentioned it earlier, cannibalization. 
So we don't get to talk about that much here on the podcast. Yeah. But I love talking about cannibalization. First off, there's always the great debate about if keyword cannibalization is even a thing. And then if you settle on the camp that it is, one of the recommended routes to um, control it is through the anchor text you use. And I'll outline a quick scenario just so people listening can kind of get their head wrapped around it. Let's say that we're talking about wildlife uh, photography, and I have a, an article on the, the best wildlife camera, and then I also, mm -hmm. also have an article on the best camera for birds. And the best camera for birds, for whatever reason, starts ranking for the best wildlife camera by accident, right? And mm -hmm. is this a problem? Do I let it go? One recommended strategy is I can control that by making sure that all the anchor text that sends juice to the bird photography camera article is not wildlife related, but bird related. That's an example. Right. So keyword cannibalization, thoughts on it? Do you, do, do you put stock in it? How do you control it? Where do internal links play into it? Yeah, so it's that's a great question. And so people are, I, I think fears of cannibalization are greatly exaggerated. And people go to great lengths to avoid it when I don't think it's an actual problem most of the time. Uh, it's really only a problem in those rare examples, and, and you mentioned one, where you just have the wrong page ranking uh, for the term. And oftentimes that that can be solved in, in other ways, and it's a, it's an indication that you need to fix uh, your main page first. But so we did this thing at Moz where we had, so Moz had, you know, 15 years of blog content. Uh, so we had multiple pages on every every topic. And I remember we were trying to rank better for uh canonicalization, which is a big term in, in SEO. So we had all these old blog posts. They were still relevant. Uh, they just happened to be older. And we just linked every one of them together using keyword rich canonicalization keywords. Uh, now, a lot of people would fear cannibalization in that case. A lot of but what we found going on here in this, uh, this, the, this good, good SEO terminology. Yeah, uh, but what we found is all the pages improved in ranking. Yeah, and the intent and Google was able to determine the intent well enough for each slight difference in page that ninety nine percent of the time they served the right page. Uh, but then at, we also, since we linked to all the other pages, if they didn't land on the right page, they could just quickly go to the the, the correct page and click on those links because we provided them with those internal links. Uh, now, in those rare rare instances where you just simply have the wrong page ranking. In, the, in those cases, yes, sometimes you might need to uh, adjust your anchor text a little bit, point more links to the page that you want to rank, uh, improve your on-page copy a bit, uh, things like that. Um, but I think those, those instances are fairly rare. Uh, e even though there is a risk of it happening, you shouldn't let it hold you back from linking internally with with keyword rich anchor text here's what here's here's one thing we found uh and this, actually i'm taking credit for this we didn't find this uh the, <laughs> the folks at search pilot have done a number of studies on this where uh you add you take you link studies you take a certain number of pages you add external link internal links to another set of pages now the fear is with cannibalization is that the pages you're linking from are going to go down in traffic or give all their juice to these other pages. So you need to be very stingy about li linking to your other pages because you don't want to cannibalize. You don't want to give out your link juice. But what has been found in study after study after study, when you link internally to other pages, uh, there's a phrase, a, a rising tide lifts all ships. Not only does traffic go up to the pages you're linking to, but traffic goes up from the pages you're linking from. And we don't know exactly why this is, but the idea is that when you link to relevant pages, you're helping the page that's doing the linking. Even if you're using keyword-rich anchor text, uh, it's it's kind of a contradictory. It's hard to wrap your head around. But go ahead, internally link with that those keyword. You're not. You're probably not shooting yourself in the foot. You're probably helping yourself, and you're helping the pages you're linking to as well. Okay. Okay. A lot to unpack there. I'm glad yeah. you touched on that. Um, um, let's let's see. I, I thought of another one while we were while we were talking here. Uh, obviously, we know uh, 404 pages are not good. Uh, yep. All websites tend to have a few, so it's yep. not like if you have a couple 404 pages, it's going to really hurt you. But um, internally linking to 404 pages does keep Google potentially crawling that page. Yep. Um, 
So let's talk about the, that 404 and if your study had anything to do with that or if you have any thoughts on it. And then also uh, 301 redirect or redirect hops when you internally link to a page that 301 redirects to another one page on your site. And how important is that to get cleaned up or is it really not that big of a deal? So 404s and 301s, uh, dead pages, redirect pages, these kind of topics as they relate to internal linking. Yeah, so 404 pages, uh, starting with those, obviously not ideal, and you want to fix those uh, as soon as possible. Uh, and you want to, you have a link going to a 404 page, um, you can either drop the link or redirect it with a 301 to a page that's as highly relevant as possible. And that's the key. If you redirect it to a page that's not relevant, uh, Google can sense that and the value of the link just kind of evaporates. Uh, we see that all the time with sites that redirect everything to their homepage. Or, you know, you bought a domain, redirected all of your homepage. It's not that relevant. It's not going to pass those link signals um, because it's it's not going to a relevant page anymore. Um 301s, the idea that, so in theory, in theory, if you have like 301, 301, 301, you finally get to your right page. In theory, Google passes equal link juice, link equity through all of those hops. In practice, Google may not follow each one of those redirects uh, perfectly, uh, may not may not get to its final destination. It's usually better to have the most direct route possible. That said, uh, I've seen many folks undertake these huge projects to fix all their 301s, fix all their 404s, and nothing happens. Uh, and that's because, possibly because they waited five years to fix them and Google's already processed and forgot about those link, link signals. But it is something you want to uh, keep on top of and do it as quickly as possible. Uh, but it's not always going to be your highest priority. Okay. Okay. Um, man, as we start to bring it, all the way back, because we've talked about so much. I hope you've had fun. I've had a great oh, yeah. time uh, talking about this stuff for darn near an hour now. Um, let's just kind of bring it back, because we we've, we kind of ping-ponged about a ton of topics and just reset the table, if you will, with the results of this study. So you studied 1,800 pages. Uh, 1800, 1,800 websites. 1,800 websites, 1,800 yeah. domains, sorry. Uh, across 23 million pages, or 23 million URLs. Um, you had access to Google Search Console data, so you're able to directly tie internal links to their actual page level traffic. Mm -hmm. And the, I, I don't want to oversummarize, so fill in the gaps where I'm wrong, but the big takeaways we can walk away with are that the number of internal links to a page does positively impact traffic. You recommend yes. 10, roughly 10. 10. Yes, 10 unique links uh, with unique anchor text going to at least your most important pages. And that was my second one. Anchor text is massively important for relevance, and you have to vary that anchor text. Varied anchor text, one across the board. We talked about exact match. We talked about duplicate. We talked about all the nuances around it. But in general, you've got to vary that anchor text across the board. Yeah, and there's nothing wrong with exact match anchor text unless you have a very small existing link profile. Uh, you want as varied of anchor text profile as possible. Uh, and if you're a small site, if you're if you don't have a lot of authority yet, I would be very wary of using exact match anchor text. Let me close out by asking you this final question: What changes, if any, to your strategy of SEO? did you make as a result of these findings? Hmm, that's a, that's an interesting question. I, my first thought was, damn, I need to be varying my anchor text more. Uh, it, you can't re you can't rely on it. Uh, you know, when I was at Moz, we, we didn't have to worry about it so much because we had gazillion links, uh, at Zippy, I don't have a gazillion link, so I have to be much more careful about it. The other thing that I've, more careful about for smaller sites is using navigation to rely on internal linking. Uh, I think for smaller sites with less authority, you have to be more conscious of putting, using, directing people in other ways than your navigation, using in text in links, body links, and using those smartly. Uh, Brian Dean, uh, Backlinko, who uh, recently was acquired by Semrush, if you look at his blog, you find hardly anything in his navigation uh it, it's almost fr I, I think it goes a little too far his site is kind of frustrating to navigate but he has he has you know home about you know like three links in his navigation he relies on in body links so hard and he's 
they're great. Uh, he and he's got a very strong internal linking game. If you want to find an example of someone who does internal linking right, back Linko, uh, and it paid off well for him. Yeah, it did. That's for sure. Um, so Cyrus, excellent, excellent having you on. Um, it's so good to finally connect after all these years of reading your different studies. People can find you at zippy.com. I know z y p p y dot com. We'll obviously include a link to this internal link uh, study that you did. Um, anywhere else people can follow along with what you're doing? Uh, I I used to always say Twitter, but boy, who knows how that's going these days. Uh... <laughs> I'm, might I'm might slightly be. more I'm slightly more active on on LinkedIn, but yeah, I'm still posting on Twitter uh, once in a while. So yeah, good, good, appreciate um, it. Thank you so much for coming on board. Um, uh, you know, if you keep releasing these 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 studies, we might have to get you back on for another one. So, but thank yeah. you again for this. It was great to to go through it in depth and be able to ask you a lot of questions that I think when people look at it, they'll probably have in some degree or some form. So it was really great to get this all out there. Thank you so much for joining us, Jared. Thank you. Appreciate it. Introducing NicheSites.com. Are you looking to scale your niche site portfolio or build your first website? Look no further than NicheSites.com. With a portfolio of successful websites and over 700 plus satisfied clients, the folks at NicheSites.com have the skills and experience to help you succeed. From keyword research to link building, content writing to done for you websites, nichesites.com offers a full range of services to help your content site grow. As the saying goes, a trial is worth more than a thousand words and they're offering a special trial just for new customers. You get 5,000 words of content completely free with your order of 10,000 plus traffic backlinks. Don't miss this opportunity. Head on over to nichesites.com slash trial and take advantage of this amazing trial offer. Again, it's niche sites, plural, nichesites.com slash trial. Go claim your free content today. Today's episode is sponsored by Search Intelligence. Here's a short clip of Ferry from Search Intelligence showing you how their agency built digital PR links to a client's website. What a masterpiece PR link building campaign with 20 links in big publications such as The Sun, Express, Mirror, Wales Online and Still Landing, I would say this campaign is a massive success. We told the press that people should turn on their heating this summer if they want to save money next winter. And we landed over 20 links in national and regional UK publications for our boiler client. That's crazy. The campaign hook was pretty clever. It is a known fact, at least in the boiler trade, that if you keep your boiler off for many months, it might rust and it might get you into trouble if you keep it turned off from spring to next winter. We therefore advised the press with an expert commentary piece on behalf of our boiler client that people should turn on their boilers this summer just when the heat wave is in full swing. This way they can avoid a boiler failure next winter and save money. Massive publications picked up our story including The Sun, Express, Mirror, Wales Online and a few more dozen publications giving our client links, lots of links and lots of happiness hormones. No wonder that so many journalists covered our story as this headline is a massive link magnet to their audience. This case study highlights the fact that a clever hook can be applied to any insight or story to make a campaign more successful and more compelling to journalists. Can you imagine when people see this headline in the news, you should turn on your boiler this summer. There's no way they would not click on it. I would click on it. So this was the hook and this is why this campaign was so successful. I hope this video inspires and shows you what's possible with a clever hook. If you want similar link building PR campaigns for your website, head to search-intelligence.co.uk and get in touch with them now.